Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Nicanor. I'm the director here at Cooper Hewitt. I'm really, really thrilled to welcome you all for one of our programs in conjunction with the Deconstructing Power W.E.B. Du Bois at the 1900s World's Fair exhibition that I hope you all have had a chance to see in the galleries upstairs. It's had an extraordinary run here at the museum and it's in its last weeks. Um, you can still catch it until May 29th. Um, and tonight's program program celebrates the, the exhibition in a very, very special way. So um, before I introduce you to the speakers, I, I wanted to make sure to say that both the exhibition and tonight's program have many powerful underlying messages. And you surely will have picked up on, on some of those if you've seen the show. But one of them is that data is important and that representation is important. And visualizing it um, in the right ways to elevate the stories that count is crucial in the world that, that we live in is, and is even more important if we, have, if we want to inspire any kind of change. And designers have a role to play in that part, which is why I'm so happy that we're having a conversation like tonight's in the National Museum of Design of the United States, because we believe that designers have a very important role in, in that uh, conversation. I also want to thank tonight um, the extraordinary learning team here at the museum and my colleague Kirsten McNally who um, did some magic to make all of this happen tonight and uh, also uh, have to uh, recognize the fact that we couldn't be hosting this stellar lineup uh, of speakers and scholars and designers if it wasn't for the generosity of our supporters. So I truly want to thank our friends at the Hearthland Foundation as well as Denise uh, Little Field Sobel for the incredible support that they have provided um, for the exhibition and for the program tonight as well. So with that, let me introduce you to our to our speakers. As you know, we're hosting a conversation tonight with our guest of honor, Mona Shalabi, and two of the show's curators, Devon Zimmerman and Cristina de Leon. So it's uh, you're you're in for in for a treat. Um, <clears throat> let me start first with Cristina. Cristina is our own associate curator of Latino design here at Cooper Hewitt, and currently also serves as the acting deputy director of curatorial. Since 2017, she has grown our museum collection of U.S. Latino and Latin American design and has also organized exhibitions and public programs and bilingual digital content for the museum. In 2021, Christina produced Cooper Hewitt's first feature-length documentary film, which was titled Mud Frontier Architecture at the Borderlands, which has been screened widely internationally. You can watch it online on our website as well. Devon Zimmerman is uh, Associate Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Ogunkit Museum of American Art in Maine. His research focuses on transatlantic networks that fueled modernism in art and in design. And as well as being the curator for Deconstructing Power, he is also the curator of several forthcoming exhibitions, including Spontaneous Generation, The Art of Liam Lee, and Ever Baldwin Down the Line. And finally, I am so, so pleased to introduce you also to Mona Shalabi, who is, of course, an award winner, writer, and illustrator. If you read the New York Times or the New Yorker or the Guardian, where she's currently the data editor, or if you get some of your content from Netflix or from BBC or from NPR, essentially, if you don't live in a closet, you've heard and seen the work of Mona, and you are as excited as I am personally to have her here tonight. Um, as someone who uses words and color and sound to help us all digest and understand and visualize this very complex um, and, and sometimes complicating and troubling world that we live in. Mona does all of that, um, mixing beauty and irony and humor and kindness, but also empathy with an arresting strength and sense of urgency, which I think is what makes her work so powerful. Her work has earned her a Pulitzer Prize, a fellowship at the British Science Association, an Emmy nomination, and recognition from the Royal Statistical Society. This last one I find the most impressive, actually. In recent years, her work has been exhibited at the Tate, at the Brooklyn Museum, the Design Museum in London, and also the House of Illustration. She is currently writing a book uh, about the ways we talk about money, which I understand will also be a documentary series. And she's also the executive producer and creative director of an upcoming animated TV show with Rami Yusuf. A24 and Amazon Studios. So with all of that, I'm going to lead you um, to welcome and help me welcome our three speakers 
tonight, Mona, Christina, and Devon. Thank you. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you all for being here. What a great way to get Cooper Hewitt public programs going, a full room, um, and all here to celebrate a great exhibition and Mona's work, which we're so, so excited to be able to talk about today. So thank you all for, for, for taking here. the time. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought we would just start off, um, for those who haven't made it upstairs, I do hope uh, at some point, if not, I don't think you can this evening, or at least you'll have to be quick and avoid a few guards um, to try to make it up before the end of the night. Uh, Deconstructing Power, W.E.B. Du Bois at the 1900 World's Fair, uh, was really a collaborative endeavor uh, with myself, uh, Lenisa Kitchener at the Library of Congress, Christina De Leon, and Yao Fan Yu here at the Cooper U or Hewitt. Um, and for those who haven't seen the show or who have, uh, the exhibition looks at the 1900 World's Fair as uh, an item, an object of design, something designed to communicate messages, to communicate ideas and ideologies about the world, and to look at how design navigated, explored, participated, or deconstructed many of those messages that were communicated. And central to that narrative is the work of W.E.B. Du Bois and his students at Atlanta University and the really remarkable data visualizations that they produced and exhibited at the 1900 World's Fair. Uh, this is the first time that uh, the original data visualizations have left the Library of Congress, so uh, it's been about 120 years or so, uh, and they're just really remarkable, remarkable items and uh, objects and so important and they are the launching point for our discussion tonight and so um, this wonderful juxtaposition and kind of my first question was Mona how did you kind of first encounter the data visualizations and uh, kind of responded to them yeah I this is not helpful but I don't really remember I don't really remember the first time that I found Du Bois's work but I remember seeing a library of congress link where you could like scroll through each of the each of the pieces and what's incredible, um, as you know, obviously having put together the exhibition, is it wasn't just these data visualizations, but he really, really went out of his way to ensure that photographs were a key part of the of the World's Fair. And I think that when you look at it on the Library of Congress, it's kind of amazing. Everything isn't really in order, like the the reference numbers. So it kind of goes photograph, incredible data visualization, photograph, 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 data visualization. So you're kind of forced to view them in conversation with one another. Um, and I just remember thinking it was the best journalism I had ever, ever, ever seen. And I think that's still the case even now. Um, I lost a day, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but in a good way, in a good way. I was just fully immersed in it, yeah. A good rabbit hole is yeah. always an amazing yeah. thing. What, what then led you to produce the series kind of responding to the data visualizations? Yeah, um, and I had been talking to an editor about how much I loved his work and I think he wanted to commission like the illustrations. And actually I worked with another organization who wanted to kind of film me making them and it was a disaster because to make them is incredibly hard. And so as we were filming, I was just like, oh, I've like fucked up this part. Like, do we have tip X? Like, I don't know how to like fix it. And again, this is my first time, just like literally 20 minutes ago, seeing the work for the very first time in real life. And to, to view it in real life is phenomenal where you're just like, how did he do it without Photoshop? Like this, <laughs> this has been Photoshop to like fix my mistakes, you know? And the idea of doing this hand lettering at that scale is just mind blowing. It's amazing, yeah. And even like, I, yeah, his is so much nicer than mine, um, which I shouldn't be surprised about, but yeah, amazing. I, what I was really intrigued and in, you know, walking through and seeing them in person and kind of getting a hint in the images and something that seemed what you innately gravitated to, whether intentionally or not, is how hand drawn, obviously because they are, but like your hand is present in the data visualization sets that you, you produced. And one of the things that I always find so stunning of seeing the ones in real life is the hands of all of the students. And you know, we, we talked about this briefly, but how do you put humanity into data and how did you think or were you thinking about that when you were working on this or 
I was, yeah. I think, um, again, the photographs are a key part of like bringing in some of that humanity. But I think actually the, the imprecision is actually really important. So even on his, it's like, it's phenomenal and it's perfect. But they, you can tell that that lettering hasn't been done with a typewriter. And I think that's really powerful and important. It's reminding the viewer that like, Humans are both responsible for the act of collecting data, for the act of selecting data, for the act of visualizing data. And um, I never want to lose that in the work that I'm creating. So computer generated graphics, I do think can feel quite inhumane, quite clinical, because you kind of lose sight sometimes of the humanity in it. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of technocratic you know, precision. And do you ever you know, think through that sense of authenticity or truthfulness that's embedded in something that's precisely drawn and then you go about you know in hand drawing these things it kind of subverts that sort of structure yeah and i think a part of it also requires like a little bit of swallowing your ego because when i first started to create this right the work wasn't really taken seriously it was viewed as less precise but what people don't realize and i don't know if i actually did it with the du bois pieces but i do it in every other piece that i do because these were done on like a thicker kind of paper but normally, I create something with ink. I mean, it depends a little bit, the kind of style, but typically I'll hand draw something. I create a computer-generated graphic, and then I go into Photoshop, and I line it up with exactly, like, pixel for pixel, whatever a computer-generated graphic would have been. So it's as precise as any bar chart, line chart that you're going to see. But I think... I'm not telling you that, I'm not putting a decimal place on it, I'm not implying the precision, because I actually think the reality of the underlying data, even now, like none of these things, even despite us like progressing so much in terms of our data gathering techniques, none of these things deserve a decimal place on them. We still don't know them to a decimal place. And so to create the hand-drawn graphic, I think also means that what you walk away with is a sense of relative scale, and that's what I'm trying to show actually. It's not about, you don't need to remember 25%. What you need to remember, I guess, is the relative size of the rate triangle relative to like the beige one. And that's the important thing to take away, yeah. Could you, you know, talk about how you respond to the way Du Bois sort of structured his data visualizations? Because yeah. we were chatting about this a bit and it's sort of legibility. Yeah, it's really important. So I hate the word infographic. Uh, I think it's like a really, really bad word. And that's because when I look at an infographic, again, there's like a lot of ego. It's like, look at how much we can like cram in rather than thinking about the viewer. But also I think when you look at infographics, sometimes you don't really know where to begin and where to end. Like, do I start in the top right hand corner? Do I start down here? And the thing that he does that's so phenomenal in his work is he's really, which is something that I strive for as well. He's like, Diminish the number of words on the graphic, which is super important in terms of accessibility, people who might speak English as a second language, people who might have a different educational background. But also part of the legibility is that you understand when you look at this graphic very quickly, I need to read the top part first. Okay, I've done that. Now I need to read like what's written next to the red circle, then what's written next to the blue circle. And your eye can dart back and forth. And you don't have to spend an hour with this to get your head around it. And I think for both, I mean, I, I really don't want to presume what Du Bois was thinking, but I assume that he also had the same preoccupation as I do, which is, I don't have your attention for long. I just assume people are going to lose interest. And so I feel this sense of urgency of like, before I lose you, I have to really quickly communicate something. It's quite an indulgent thing to assume that anyone gives a shit about what you're saying. Like, yeah. And I think he assumes probably he's working against a tide. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, you know, I, I try to think about the World's Fair attracted something like 50 million people. You're in a convention center like setting. Yeah. And how do you get someone to stop? Yeah. Let alone how do you get a white European audience to stop? Mm -hmm. And how do you get them to bite into this data and actually sit with it yeah. and think about it? Yeah. It's a tall, tall yeah. order. Yeah. And it is the anonymous passerby. You mm -hmm. don't have a known audience per se as you reach out. And do you think about I do. audience? Yeah. And I think actually maybe that's a way in which we potentially diverge. So I think actually when I started out in journalism, I was thinking about our modern equivalent of the white rich European wandering through, which is like, I guess, uh, especially in the lead up to the 2016 election, I was very concerned working at The Guardian that the people who read my work are people who already agree with everything I'm trying to say, right? Like I'm talking about gun control and people are reading these charts and they're fully on board already. Like, what am I really achieving here? And I think that 2016 was a really pivotal point in my career where watching 
Trump win, and watching things like the Muslim ban come in, I was like, okay, no, actually, educating my side is actually really, really critical. I'm not trying to convert anyone. That's a waste of my time and energy. Helping somebody understand these are your my, these are your legal rights as a migrant. These are your legal rights. This is a way to go ar go about getting an abortion if you can't get an abortion. That is a really important part of journalism, it, it, and it isn't about changing anyone's mind. So I'm not. At this point, if people aren't convinced about like decarceration, if they're not convinced about about the police state, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm not going to convince anyone. That's not part of my that's not part of my job. Yeah. Well, I think we we spoke about this going through the show. Is yeah. uh, you know, Du Bois was struggling with this hope, almost a utopian hope, mm. that data and science and rational argumentation could deconstruct some of these cultural myths and pressures. And that intensity is often mm. over or superseding any kind of rationality or rational argument. People don't want to have a certain type of rational argument. Or you know, internal biases, bases, wants for affirmation yeah. is sort of subsumed and missed with that. Um, but then let me ask you, as yeah. like curators that spend so much time in this archive, do you think he changed people's minds in 1900? Yes and no. Okay. Exactly. Same you know, more. Same yeah. more. Well, because uh, again, you start thinking about reception too, and so you know, he the exhibit got awarded a, a gold medal at the fair. Um, it was triumphantly heralded in the black press and was largely suppressed in the white reviews of the exhibition. And you know, then you kind of enter into this parallel discussion of how, what communities, what arguments are you trying to make? And I think you see that shift when he writes The Souls of Black Folk three years later, something that's deeply embedded in his own personal experience and uh, lived experience specifically um, devolves, yeah. And just to be clear, writing for your own community doesn't mean you failed no. in any way. Like that work is crucial, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But, <laughs> um, this is another data visualization that I just kind of was struck by as, as we were going through. I really didn't notice the parallel until I was sent the slides ahead of time and I was like, oh wow, yeah. Um, so for those who haven't seen the show, uh, this is a really, really stunning data visualization by Du Bois, which charts um, the exponential growth of uh, black asset valuation after reconstruction. And what he does is embed within this simple linear data line uh, cultural forces, including the rise and existence of the KKK during uh, Reconstruction, and then uh, charts other events like political unrest. But then the dip occurs within the context of uh, lynching, which he names, and uh, prescriptive laws, Jim Crow laws at the end, and introduces this sort of data visualization, but also these external forces. And you know his willingness to sort of both chart these often suppressed or unspoken elements of American society are embedded within you know, these other exponentially kind of hopeful visions. But what I, you know, both jumping off of that and, and thinking through this is one, uh, you know, I think KKK groups and membership and participation, especially as someone who you know, experienced the 1990s and some of the mythologies about race and existence and politics within the 90s and late 80s, but the growth of KKK groups through into the 2000s. What attracted you to like that I don't know about data set? Is well, yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, again, this is like a really, the visualization is as much about showing the thing as showing our understanding of the thing. So like this was data that was collected by the Southern Poverty Law Center. That's the right description, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, like the data was actually pretty inaccessible. It was in a PDF, so I had to spend time like typing out one number at a time and the years to like create this. And then I just wanted to like, I just, you know, you have this series of numbers that are in a table. I quickly turned it into a line chart and I immediately saw like this shape. But I also think surely this is exaggerated. Like surely I just, I view this as inherently imprecise. Like, how is it that we are tracking the number of KKK groups in this country? Like, ha have those methods of measurement, is this about tracking how we spent more resources in measuring it, and then the, the allocation of resources to measure this dropped off a cliff, or is it that the number of active KKK groups dropped off a cliff, or is it that they, they continue to proliferate in different ways? I don't know. And then it's like, what is my job as a journalist? Should I be figuring out what 
Should I know what I don't know about this data before I put it out? Or is this like the beginning point of a conversation? I don't know. I didn't answer your question, did I? <laughs> no, sorry. No, but how, how, so this is actually really interesting, but when you're collecting data and when you're thinking about data sets that you're approaching, mm. there is always the risk of, well, what am I marshalling data to? And when can that narrative that I'm laying out with the data that I'm visualizing potentially turn or get out of or lose the message that you're putting out or yeah. seeking to sort yeah. of skew the story that you're trying to tell. Um, it's scary, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked about this just briefly um, before we came out, we were talking about the risks of misinformation, right? And how, again, uh, it's something I think about all the time is like, how could this one visualization be interpreted in a different way? But again, the stakes of that change depending on the subject that you're talking about. So like, I don't know, I did, I did uh, an illustration I was looking at this morning uh, for something else that was about like the percentage distribution of pubic hair grooming injuries. Like if people misunderstand where they're going to injure themselves when they're grooming their pubic hair, it's not the end of the world. Like the stakes are relatively <laughs> low. But then when COVID happened, I was like, if I'm miscommunicating data about the efficacy of vaccines or the efficacy of masks, I could literally, and I, and I felt that on a human level anyway, just... I felt so overwhelmed by this idea of like the fragility of everything and this idea that I could cause harm just even to my neighbors. And then the idea of my, it, that like really bled into the idea of my work and the recognition that I do have some kind of platform. And if I get things wrong, it's potentially disastrous. So I think about that all the time. And there's, oh, you can take steps to try to minimize that, right? So I have a group text thread with friends who do nothing to do with data, nothing to do with journalism and I don't provide them with any context, I say, here's an image, what do you understand from it? So you can do that, but obviously it's still imprecise. I still, you know, there are dynamics in all of our friendship groups that mean that we're still coalescing around certain, I don't know, certain communities that aren't representative of everyone who's gonna see the work. So I don't know, you, uh, for me, my, my, my goals have shifted from this idea of like doing good which feels so lofty and arrogant, this idea of minimizing harm. So I'm always thinking of like, what, is the way, what are the ways in which this work could be harmful? Does this imply that the KKK is going away and no one really needs to worry anymore? I, I don't think that is what it is implying because there's that crazy second spike, but that's something that I think about before I post it, yeah. I still didn't answer the question, did I? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, we're just gonna have a conversation. Exactly. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I guess this comes to, again, this, this question of your thought process when not just maybe limiting or controlling because data has so much power of the types or where your stories are going, but then how you construct a narrative mm -hmm. in the data that you were then illustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt really compelled both because of the, the kind of correlation between Du Bois' work, but just how this average voter wait times and how you use individual voters and create these curving linear lines. How do you go about thinking of, here, I'm gonna set this story out and play with it? Yeah, I, so I'd never seen these both side by side and I didn't even realize that I had like plagiarized him. <laughs> I'm like, but did, did, was I thinking of him when I met, like I genuinely thought I'd come up with a really innovative idea all of my own and maybe like he was right there in the back of my head. So when I saw this, I was like, oh gosh. Um, I wanted to imply this idea of like, it makes sense because often obviously when you're standing in line, the queue kind of wraps around like this. Um, I. Uh, so much of the work is about trying to capture a feeling and the idea of like, literally I got off a plane like two days ago and you get off at Newark and again, the immigration process, if you don't have a US passport, oh my God. And you're, and you're counting the number of times that the line weaves rounds and you're doing this mental math of like, okay, like I've been here for 10 minutes. I saw this much of the queue go down, how much, I'm, like I'm, I'm trying to capture that feeling of just frustration in the thing and so the wrapping around i actually think it affects the the legibility of the chart it actually makes it you have to do a little bit more work but it does a better job of capturing the feeling so it's succeeding at least on that measure and i think again you walk away with the main thing which is the relative scale it doesn't actually matter exactly in to some extent it doesn't actually matter exactly how many minutes african americans are waiting in line although obviously that does matter it's the injustice of seeing that number set up against those groups up top that is supposed to invoke a feeling of like, wow, this system is intentionally and deeply broken. I do just want to say one last thing about, th about this one, which is something I think about all the time, 
is how am I representing gender? And also how am I representing race, right? So like even Latinos, and again, the language that I'm using very often, I'm just grabbing exactly the language that is used in the census. Should I be mimicking that language? Should I be questioning it and pushing it? I don't know. But even Latinos, like th that is not a race. I could have depicted that character in any skin tone and how I choose to do that is something that I'm always grappling with. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But I'm drawn to the, this, this, you know, again, because we, you use something like infographics or data and it immediately dries the subject out and your focus on intensity, this kind of emotional resonance, whether or not that that is a powerful tool in data in story I mean in storytelling because that, that is what you're doing is is telling a story through data yeah. that resonates yeah. and and I think that's something that we shy away from sometimes in journalism this idea of like trying to elicit an emotion feels inherently manipulative or something but I view the line between journalism and activism as being a bit more blurry and I think you can't be depicting this stuff without having some hope of changing it I just that feels ludicrous to me. So, and I think that anger is actually a really critical part of change. I think anger is really underrated. And I think you should feel angry when you look at some of these charts. Yeah. So speaking of census, yeah. <laughs> um, this was a data visualization that Devin and I, when we were looking through your portfolio, immediately thought we have to talk about this um, for many reasons. One, because I think a, a big underlining discussion or point in this discussion is the census. Yes. How do we use the census in this country? How is it mobilized? Um, how is it disseminated? How is it visualized mm -hmm. in many different ways? I think Du Bois is a great example of um, one person who worked with a group of people to create this, this um, incredible set of data visualizations that was talking about really difficult, difficult topics for the United States. And, you know, when I think about the census, you know, I'm, I think about this, this part of the census a lot, right? I'm the curator of Latino design. What does that mean? Um, I feel you on in terms of like the pressures that you have to represent a type of data. When I was first hired here, there was a lot of pressure to represent what is Latino design? What does it mean for a museum to collect objects that represent the history of a group of people from a very yeah. expansive yeah, yeah, yeah. region yeah. in the world? And so looking at this data set and thinking about who, who is represented in the categories yeah. of race or ethnicity in the census, starting from the 18th century and even to today, you know, the folders, which are so inane, right? Like that, that folder that says like, that's you. Yeah. Um, but seeing it in black, white, American, Indian, Alaskan, Asian, other, Hispanic, Hawaii, Pacific Islander, it makes me think a lot also about the breadth of what makes up the United States. Yeah. What is the United States? Yeah. How do we understand the US today, not just from a point of race and ethnicity, but also from a point of territory, right? Right when you see Pacific Islander, you think- Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are Pacific Islanders Americans? I mean, that, that is a question that I'm sure many people have asked um, themselves. And when you look at it, right, like you only get that category until 2020. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, this data visualization, mm -hmm. how you think about census data, and how you think through some of the um, problematic yeah. um, points of, of interpretation when thinking mm -hmm. through in particular, I think this one is really interesting because you're looking at an expansive time mm. of census record keeping. Yeah. So it's interesting that you even described it as a data visualization because I guess technically it isn't. There's no data there. It's. I guess you're right. I guess it, I think about it as like the data of data. Yeah, it's yeah. information design. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think the Census Bureau actually published this like beautiful wall chart kind of thing that explains the evolution of these different categories. And this is obviously like massively simplified, but I think 
for me anyway, you walk away with a few different takeaways, right? You see the at what point various categories appear, you see which categories we're left with, and fascinatingly, you see this thing of like some of the categories disappearing and then reappearing, which is like maybe one of the juiciest parts of this. <laughs> um, so I think I'm inherently drawn to this because uh, my ethnicity is Arab, right? And we are never, 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 never on anything. Like I literally went to a dermatologist office where like the skin form like was, I think it was 200 categories and not one of them was like so detailed. And I went to go and speak to her and she was Egyptian. And I was like, babe, why, why, what, what? And she was like, oh no, we just downloaded it off the internet. Like it just isn't. And the history of that is really, really fascinating, right? Like if I understand correctly, I should really figure out the, the precision of this story because I tell it a lot and I'm still not, I'm still a little bit vague on the details. But if I understand correctly, I believe that in this country, they had finally coalesced about the idea of adding Arab to the census. I think the category was actually going to be Middle East and North African, which I want to circle back to. Um, and they had agreed upon it in like the summer of 2001. And then September 11th happened and they were like, yeah, let's not bother adding this to the census because no one's going to want to tick this box. And they're right, right? Like all of my family members, anytime they get given a government form, they're like, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't understand how this is going to be used. I don't believe for a second this is going to this is going to serve my community. And we have such a history of surveillance. Like I do not trust this. Um, so uh, I would say, and well, let me circle back to the Middle East, North African thing. <laughs> um, it was fascinating. I don't I don't know if she's here, but we bumped into um, an incredible uh, geographer when we were just looking at the Du Bois exhibit. Um, her name was Elizabeth. I don't I don't think she's um, down here, but Michelle. she was talking. Michelle, sorry, Michelle, thank Michelle you. Michelle Lanier. Um, the um, but she was talking about radical cartography, and again, like even the description Middle East. Middle East relative to who? Relative to what? Like, easy, like I don't think we're Middle East. And again, the grouping of those categories makes a very of those countries makes varying degrees of sense. So, I think a baked into it is this idea of like, who are we counting? What are we counting? <sighs> And the fluidity of these categories that feel neat, like the idea of a folder feels neat, but it's also bull bullshit. But but these folders can serve us. And we all know that, like there are, there are rooms that I'm in where it serves me to connect with other people and say, hey, we're both Arab, we're both here. We're gonna set aside the fact that you're Yemeni, I'm Iraqi, it's fine, it's fine. We just need to like, you know, we need to get this thing done and that's okay. And so like we, there's a strategy to surviving in this country and there is a strategy to gathering data and yeah it's important to be strategic sometimes if you want to survive and thrive yeah. well said <laughs> um this was also one of the data visualizations that i loved um for a lot of different reasons because i i think not only is it speaking to inherently how are we connected and also who hasn't thought of either doing a DNA test or hasn't done one already. Um, and don't do them, please don't do them, I'm really sorry. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, um, and I, I'd love for us to talk about yeah. it a little bit more because I think when you look at this mm. chart, you think, you know, oh wow, this is really interesting, the hands and the way, you know, everyone's connected. But then you start to think about sort of the more, um, darker yeah like points of 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 what it means to share data uh, share dna but also what does it mean to give your dna out yes very freely yeah, yeah. to someone which is immediately where my head yeah. went like yeah. what does it mean when i swab and then i send it off and it goes to a, a bank a dna oh, bank. so much worse than that i mean Talk about well, it. Okay, just really briefly, <laughs> just please, please, if you haven't already done it, um, just try to refrain. Uh, there are massive consent issues. If your sibling does it, you're in the database regardless of whether or not you want it to opt in. How, like, it's madness. 23andMe's long-term strategy was always to get into pharmaceuticals. That was always the goal of the company. They have successfully done that now. So it, we are very, very close to a point, if we're not there already, where when you're inquiring about insurance, they already know on the phone with you that you're going to get Alzheimer's in 20 years, but you don't know. It and they can affect your premiums off the basis of that. Like it is terrifying. Um, 
And it also, to go back to the earlier slide for a moment, this idea of being told exactly where you're from. I understand different communities who have had their history stolen from them, the desire to reclaim it. However, the data itself is not that precise. The idea of telling somebody, you know, you are 23% Scottish is really dangerous because actually the reality, and this is something I try to talk about all the time about, how do you communicate the numbers on either side of that? Because the reality is what we can tell from those DNA tests is actually you are probably somewhere between 5% and 40% Scottish, let's say. And those are two radically different numbers, but no one wants that. They want to be able to go to the bar with their friends and say, hey, I just found out I'm 23% Scottish. And actually, why do you want, again, setting aside communities who have had their history stolen from them, if you are somebody who just wants to find your a white person going about your business in this country and you are interested in the fact that you're 23% Scottish. Why? I'm curious why <laughs> you want to know that and what that means for you. And actually, I'm really concerned about the rise of eugenics, which again is something that Du Bois was thinking about all the time. How do you present this information about things like different racial and ethnic groups in this country without implying that any of those differences are innate? How do you show that all of these differences are systemic? All of them are the result of structural differences that exist in our lives and nothing about this is biological. And that's something that I worry about all the time, whether I'm showing, I don't know, like even the voter wait times, you know there'll be a racist person who looks at that, who thinks that it, it means something different to what it actually means. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I think a lot about um, something that we talked about upstairs, which is how do you express the blind spots yes. in the data? Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk about yeah, that a yeah, little yeah. bit because it's it's an interesting discussion when you're thinking about responsibility yes. as a journalist and as someone who works so closely with numbers, which as a society we often equate as fact, right? Yes. Like. Here's a number. It's been calculated in this, you know, mythical way, or maybe we know exactly how it's calculated, or maybe we're just taking the number because, you know, I saw it in the New York Times or I saw it in whatever um, communication strategy mm. that I use. But, you know, there's a lot more Absolutely. steps yeah. that go into creating and that that story putting together those numbers and then sharing it with the public. And, you know, as curators, like we have this idea of like, we want to do a show and we're in our bunker and we're writing and we're thinking. And a lot of that work is done in a whole, you know, like we're, we're in our own orbit. And then you put it out there to the public and you're like, yeah. Yeah. did I get every single fact correct? Um, is someone going to say, no, it wasn't that date, it was this, yeah. or no, you're completely misinterpreting what this work was all about. Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk a little yeah, bit yeah. about that, because it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah. So I guess to build on your parallel there, data collection, just like curation, is expensive, right? Like it costs a lot of money to do these surveys. And therefore, because of that, the data reflects the existing systems of power because it reflects where do, where do we attribute value? Which communities do we think are worth counting? Which diseases do we think are worth counting? Are we measuring tap water, lead in tap water in this community or this community? And so part of my work is about trying to show the data that doesn't get collected or the data that is extra imprecise. There's an artist whose name I always forget that is incredible. It's just a, it's a visual artist who doesn't have a background in statistics who created um, a piece called like the, the library of missing data sets, and it's a filing cabinet with labels on it that says things like black maternal mortality rates in city X. It's all the data sets that no one has collected and they're just empty files. It's, it's beautiful. Anyway, uh, so to give you a really specific example of the ways that I'm trying to communicate uncertainty, there are a range of tools that we use in data visualization that we've used to do this all the time, right? Instead of a solid line, can we do a dashed line to communicate uncertainty? Um, there was another mass shooting that was, um, it was, I think, was it in Atlanta where it was a massage parlor that specifically targeted Asian women? So for that, I wanted to show actually the vulnerability of being a sex worker and how that puts you at risk. 
that data doesn't exist. The government doesn't collect data on sex workers, much less also, um, I mean, actually there's really difficult data to collect about how being transgender or gender non-conforming affects your probability of experiencing violence, right? And many people get misgendered when in, even on their death certificates, right? So for that, I believe what I did was some incredible resource had looked at sex worker deaths and had created upper and lower estimates. And I visualized it with a circle, but it's a circle with like an ombre where the circle kind of diffuses. So you don't really have a precise sense of where the circle exactly starts and ends, but you do have a sense by comparing this circle to that circle that sex workers are people who are at higher risk of being murdered. And again, it's all about like that story of scale of like, if you, under, if you can understand, if the one thing you can take away from the data without question, regardless of where you start on the upper or lower bounds, is this community is more at risk, that the data has still served its purpose because it's saying something about the allocation of resources and what we need to do. And then the accuracy of the data, I mean, it still matters. We still should be collecting that data, but it's still worth putting out that data, even though it's imprecise. I, I still think it was worth creating that visualization, yeah. And actually, that's a point that often gets brought up in Du Bois. How accurate was the yeah, data? Yeah. And it's interesting because we did a talk with um, a few weeks ago with um, two uh, scholars from the Du Bois Center. And one of them uh, said, what does it matter? Like, why are we questioning whether or not the data is precise yeah. or is like exactly what um, was the situation at that time. Like, what was being done was providing a story, information, context, and it's so and much a story bigger. that is factually true. Exactly. It's absolutely yes. factually true, That's, regardless of the numbers. He was depicting absolutely. injustice that was factually correct. Yeah. And she said what she, actually, I, I thought it was really inter interesting because she said, I hate that question, yeah. Yeah. and I don't, like to really fall into, yeah. you know, how hyper accurate yeah. it was this data and, in 1900. And I would also say, who gets pulled up on their accuracy? Were mm -hmm. other people questioning other scholars of the time in 1900 to be like, yeah. oh, was your data exactly accurate? Why are they only coming after Du Bois yeah. to pose yeah. those questions? And that's still the case now. I mean, my first job in this country was working for Nate Silver, a man whose data gathering was not questioned with the same rigor that mine is. And I would say that his efforts in journalism are not only imprecise, they are dangerous for democracy to tell people who is gonna win before people go out and cast their vote. Why are we, why is that a journalistic endeavor? I don't understand. It's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we wanted to mix it yeah, up a yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I found very, I think, um, poignant, but also really excruciating, like I felt a lot of anger when I first saw Thanks. this video yeah. for a lot of reasons. One is that like, who hasn't dealt with a bad landlord? It's, it's living in New York City yeah. like, as a New Yorker. You're dealing with bad landlords. You're dealing every day with some issue that you're trying to get fixed. You're paying exorbitant rents. Yeah. Um, and it's really, really difficult. But then when you see that statistic on the worst landlord in New York City versus the New York City Housing Authority, mm -hmm. NYCHA, who houses officially about 340,000 New Yorkers, but unofficially that number is could be well over half a million. And to see all of those housing violations, and also thinking about our context here in New York City, Cooper Hewitt is in an area that's one of the wealthiest zip codes in New York City, if not 
the actual wealthiest, yeah. right? And if you just go a little bit further uptown to East Harlem, where I grew up, it's the second largest concentration of NYCHA housing. And so this juxtaposition of, of neighborhoods, of wealth, of access, of who gets to live in a dignified way. For me, when I saw this video, I, it just immediately became so visceral to me. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about thinking through um, this video and why you juxtaposed the landlord with NYCHA. Yeah. So, um, okay, so the starting point for it was that uh, I had a very bad landlord at the time. <laughs> uh, I had lived in the same apartment in Fort Green next to my neighbor who came today who actually bought me a Du Bois book that I really haven't forgotten. It was so lovely of you. And he has a great coffee company as well, um, if anyone's interested in coffee. Um, I was living with a very, very bad landlord. I'd lived there for five years in that apartment in Fort Greene. I mean, I don't think that you, I don't think this should actually be said. It's totally besides the point. But was a good tenant. Like I paid my rent on time. You know, every single winter without fail, the heat would go out. Um, and I think I, it's, I'm actually shocked retrospectively how willing I was to tolerate some of the absolute, like, in, absolutely inappropriate. She had keys to my apartment and would sometimes just wander in. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, she lived downstairs, it was a three floor brownstone. Um, she asked me to feed her cats when she went away, which I dutifully did. I don't know, anyway, basically, um, around about the time that I was making this, I got a little letter slipped under my door, which was an eviction notice. Even though we like share the building together, she could have told me. Um, and it's because her daughter was coming home from college and she wanted to give her daughter my apartment. Uh, and luckily at the time, there was more of a conversation happening actually about housing rights, that, thanks to COVID, I mean, because of COVID. Um, so anyway, I was feeling very frustrated and very pissed off at the time that I made it. I am somebody who, I think it's quite clear, like my politics is very left. <laughs> um, and I think that NYCHA should exist. I think the government has a responsibility to house house the city's residents, who, who, especially those who are in incredibly vulnerable situations. But I also think it's really important that just because I'm left, I'm like super lefty, it doesn't mean that government gets a free pass. And that like, yeah, Jason Corn is horrific. And like, this also has to be addressed. So I think, yeah, that was kind of what I was trying to say, I guess, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, for me, I guess I thought it was really striking because, um, Nature's everywhere yeah. Yeah. through these very large um, campuses. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're actually, that's how they're referred to yeah. as these like large scale campuses um, where they're dealing with so many issues um, like sanitation, asbestos, and asbestos yeah. crime. Yeah. I mean, even just having lighting yeah. in some of those buildings and some of those walkthroughs is and disability access for people who have different yeah different abilities to be able to enter their own homes and exit their own homes and the fact that these are microcosms of of a very large expanse of people that are living in new york mm. aging population children families mm. um single people but oftentimes these apartments have multiple, multiple generations in a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment. Um, but they have, it's it's almost like, well, if you want to, like I, I think about this a lot when, when any one of my friends is talking about like a rental, it's like, it doesn't check all the boxes, but like I can afford the rent or yeah. like, um, you know, we're working it out and it's okay. And like, I think I'm happy. So like, I'll stay here even though um, my landlord's coming into my apartment whenever they <laughs> yeah. want, right? You rationalize it. And in a way, this is sort of saying like, well, you have, you know, this um, subsidized housing. So you should- You should shut up basically. Yeah. And, and you and should be okay yeah. Yeah. with the fact that you are living in conditions that are inhumane in some cases undignified, and yeah, undignified yeah, exactly yeah. yeah it's horrific and i think that um we 
Listen, I, like I said, anger is really, really important, but it's also really exhausting to be angry all the time. And, and the ways in which you can go about redressing this, it is so incredibly bureaucratic. Even when I was fighting my landlord, I live in the same building with her. Like, what am I going to do? Like, and again, people who speak English as a second language, who, people who don't speak any English at all, going about trying to fight for your rights is exhausting. So I also think that actually, if I was to critique this work, was I really sharing in, in conjunction with this what you can do about it if you live in one of these NYCHA buildings where your housing rights are being violated by the people that are supposed to provide those very rights to you? So that's a good question, yeah. right? You didn't provide the, what can you do? Maybe I did. I don't think I did. Yeah, maybe <laughs> I did, yeah. But when you, when perhaps you can't do it all, right? So what, what do you hope people do with all of the content that you put out. What are you hoping is engendered by, you know, that one mm -hmm, person mm -hmm. who's either scrolling through Instagram or Google something yeah. and like your image or one of your videos pops up in in a perfect world mm -hmm. where as you're so conscious of someone, you know, maybe just giving you five seconds or yeah. 10 seconds to view your work, what do you hope the takeaway mm -hmm. is? So there's like two extremes. I think the least uh, ambitious and like at a bare minimum, I hope that people feel like seen and they feel like their experience has been has been captured and like has been recognized and has been respected in that depiction. And I think to feel seen is no small thing, especially if you're part of a community that isn't normally seen or represented. Um, and then at a more extreme level, like, policy change I don't know obviously that's pretty ambitious but um I don't I really don't know I think we spend so much time like depicting over and over and over again what's wrong and I don't really know if it's contributing to change but I do feel like I don't know I feel like we're edging towards a revolution of the proletariat and everything's getting really really bad <laughs> so I don't know yeah maybe things will change hope so but because I, 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 what I, what both in terms of the way that this video operates in intensity and it goes back to intensity because mm. I don't think it's anger. I mean, anger is the intensity that comes out of it, but it's like how you're modulating an intense emotional response, mm -hmm. which sent us collectively down a rabbit hole, which I think is an effective praxis mm -hmm. to come out of like intensity, mm -hmm. which was the, the, the prestige or the, the turn in the data that you present, which is. Here's this person. And I feel like conceptualizing anger towards a single individual is easier to do. Yes. Um, and yeah. then the way you switch it into something much more systematic and technocratic, that this is a person, then here's a system. Mm. And then that mm. almost embodies a system to then be like, you know, the unverbal anger mm. of it that then is like, wait. I love that depiction. It's like part one like really micro human level, mm -hmm. part two systemic. But I think part three has to be some kind of articulation of like, where do we go from here? You know, I, I think a lot about, um, there was a piece that was published years ago in the New York Times about um, labor rights violations in New York nail salons. I don't remember, it was like a huge piece and it was showing how the vast majority of those workers are women. They are systematically abused in those roles, underpaid. And I remember everyone came into work that week being like, my nails are bare, I didn't do them this week. And I was like, mm, I don't know if that's the solution. Uh, and I think that that journalist had a real responsibility to not only highlight what was going on, and of course it requires a change in labor rights laws and the way that those institutions are, um, the, like the kind of vigilance over workers' rights. But it's also like, you know, even if it's as small as if you can afford to get your nails done, make sure that you are tipping them cash in hand, like at the end, make sure it's these amounts, like, and if you can't afford to tip that, don't go. I don't know, but like to just abstain, I don't think that's the solution. And to just put out this huge body of work that was read by so many people who then walked away with a different kind of conclusion from it, surely you failed in some way as a journalist. Maybe. <laughs> This is an audio chart. Oh God, it's this one. During puberty, boys' testicles get bigger. And as they get bigger, their voices deepen. Tom will now demonstrate. Hi, my name is Tom. 
This is how I sound with testicles that are one milliliter. This is how I sound with testicles that are five milliliters. This is how I sound with testicles that are 10 milliliters. This is how I sound with testicles that are 15 milliliters. This is how I sound with testicles that are 20 milliliters. This is how I sound with testicles that are 25 milliliters. This is how I sound with testicles that are 30 milliliters. Sound. Make sound. It stop. Make it stop. Sound. <laughs> sound. Sound. Oh, God. Sound. I really like this. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> being someone who works in the visual arts, mm -hmm. it is constantly a conversation of you are in a medium that is about looking and thinking about how do you communicate to an audience who may not be able to look, yeah. may not have that sight. Yeah. And so I was just really compelled about the audio component about this. How do you think of data, not purely just as data visualization, but different audiences and ways of communicating those kind of data stories? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked this question because I think about it a lot and I still think that I'm not doing a good enough job at it. Um, but yeah, obviously data visualization massively alienates people who are blind or visually impaired. And I think that there is like, um, an ease of going back to those same techniques where data sonification is is incredible. And it's just because it hasn't been explored to the same extent that there aren't those same kind of go-to quick results. Um, but it, it, I mean, it makes sense in so many ways. Even um, I was like exploring different ways that data sonification has been used in the past. And if you think about even something as simple as like a lab setting, when you're looking through a million different results and you're trying to find who has the result that means that they're unwell, it makes far more sense to sound an alarm for that one result rather than having someone scroll through visually all of the results. Like data sonification, like every method of accessibility, every time I build on sound into a visual, it doesn't just benefit communities who are blind or visually impaired. Everyone is like, oh my God, I understand it so much better now. Um, and so all I can say is that it's still a work in progress. I've created tactile work in the past to try and work on that. I've created data sonifications. Um, I'd love to just like keep on experimenting. And again, part of the, the reason why I did voice is because so much of my work is trying to like make the medium feel correct to whatever the data is. So even if I were to communicate something like how the smell of New York City has changed over time, could I like do that with like a data smellification thing where like you could smell urine on a map or something, I don't know, and you could know you're in like, you know, you're in Soho just from like <laughs> sniffing the map. That'd be cool, right? <laughs> Smell urine? No? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. In the summer. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. there has to be a heat component. All year round. Who are you kidding? All year round. Yeah. But it, there's, it mixes. You it's know, true. you get the it's fragrance yeah. of the spring, yeah. flowers yeah. in bloom, and urine in the background. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I guess that goes to, like, storytelling. Because, yeah. uh, you know, in your introduction, you were doing a number of different types of projects mm -hmm. across a number of different types of medium. Mm -hmm. And the format, the media becomes kind of the message in what types of stories you tell. Mm -hmm. So do you think as you're sort of working on a podcast, or working on a television show and trying to craft narratives, does that kind of do your ideas and projects bounce off of one another? Or does a data visualization or a research project that leads to a data visualization then lead to a podcast? Or how do you kind of work yeah. cross platform? Um, I'm thinking a lot about just time and how little time we all have and like, is there just a way to like make it more efficient that I can just like take apart this one chunk of what I've done and kind of reutilize it in a different space? Um, but yeah, I do you feel like TV is quite a different beast and it's been exciting to try to understand that. Um, yeah, but also quite weird. The, the TV show is with Amazon and like Amazon is the devil. So can we, can we just transition to the next slide? Yeah. Oh yeah, Amazon is the devil. <laughs> Um, and I love how you just won a Pulitzer for okay. this body of work. Congratulations. Um, and so why don't you, you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Because I, I can imagine there must be a lot of feelings, right? You won this incredible award for... The guy who's paying my paycheck. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I love this one. I mean, it's a series of, of data visualizations that you did. But this one in particular is incredible, right? Because everyone understands what a snow globe is. Um, and to say that a tiny flake mm. in a snow globe, 
and put that is the wealth of an average US um, household in comparison to the Statue of Liberty for Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, again, thinking about the way to communicate yeah. information that's just so easily digestible and also impactful. Mm -hmm. This is a really incredible example of that. But then, right, now you're, now you're in the situation where you're working with Amazon. How do you reconcile yeah. with that? I mean, as, yeah. as people who work in cultural institutions and museums in general, that's something that institutions like are constantly grappling with. Like, who are <laughs> the wealthy people where yeah. it's okay yeah. Yeah, to yeah. take their um, their funding or it's okay to collaborate with them. I mean, those are difficult conversations yeah. that, um, that you must be having yeah. with yourself and yeah. had. And we certainly within the museum sector are, are having much more. Yeah. So maybe I'll just start by talking about the, the piece. So um, the it was a weird commission, right? It was like, can we find ways to visualize his wealth? And I guess a lot of journalism is supposedly telling you something new. But in this, like everybody in this room knows Bezos is filthy rich. And so the goal is actually not to communicate anything new, but maybe to resensitize you to something that feels now like mundane or like it's like a natural fact of the way of the world that here's this incredibly rich person. But no, no, like this is so obscene. And how can I make you feel the obscenity of that again? Um, it's kind of interesting as well because it's a data visualization without a single number on it, which is again something that I weirdly strive towards because people hate maths. And so I'm trying to like, you know, get rid of the numbers on the piece, which is weird. Um, and yeah, I feel like it was relatively successful. But yeah, I'm currently collecting a paycheck from Amazon. Also, I'll just say, yeah. Smithsonian also has received funding from Jeff Bezos. Oh, wow. So we, okay, so, okay. We're know, all in the sin we're, bucket. Okay, we're all, great, great, we're great, all, great. I don't want okay. you to think you're out there. Yeah. Us too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's really interesting. Okay. Okay. I technically okay. don't work for this Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> um, well, I would say that, like, uh, maybe this feels too radical a position I don't really think once you get to a certain level of money I don't think it can ever be clean like all of that money is corrupt and filthy and, and I'm not excusing it at all um, I feel like part, part of my thinking I guess was that if I if I ever hesitated to make this piece then I needed to quit the job but like I was like more than willing to just be like I'm gonna make it and if I lose the job then then it is what it is um, Unfortunately, I guess it's a bit of a testament to how ineffective journalism is that Bezos isn't aware of this. Bezos doesn't give a shit. Like, he's, <laughs> he doesn't even know that I work for him in the, his, like, empire. It doesn't make a difference. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's, like, um, Robin Hooding it to, like, take his money and then use it to, like, subvert his... his I, I don't know. I think a lot of people under American capitalism are walking very difficult moral lines. Uh, and part of my work, and including the book that was mentioned in the, in, the, in the introduction, the thing that I'm really trying now to do is to be really radically transparent about those moral questions and about where I'm navigating them. So even something as simple as part of the goal of the book is to have people talking in a much more lucid and articulate way about our personal individual wealth and our individual income and like how it would change the dynamic in this whole room and this whole conversation if the three of us in addition to our like assumed race and our assumed gender being visible also had like labels above our head with our annual take-home income and what does that say about the power dynamic between the three of us and the way that you all view us um i don't know all i can say is that honesty feels like the first step for me to say this is fucked up that i work for this guy and then I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect point okay, to open so it up to questions. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, uh, will someone be walking around with them? Oh, there we go. We'll have a mic. And thank you all for coming out on like a Friday night. Yeah. Oh. Um, thank you. You're going to have to stand, apparently. I, know, yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, hi, my name is Azar. Uh, first of all, for so many brilliant things you said, you kept saying, I don't know. And I was like, that, you know. You've been telling us the whole night. Um, 
I'm also a storyteller, and I struggle with the idea of, do I tell a mainstream story mm. that happens to happen to a brown man, or do I tell a brown person's story and hope that somebody listens? And you kind of touched on that, and I just wanted to find out, how did you make your decision? Yeah. What helped you, what didn't yeah. help you? Uh, that I could steal, maybe? Yeah. Um, thank you. It's a really good question. Uh, I think for anyone who has any kind of like access to an identity that is marginalized, you know that that is formative of ev like everything, but it's also not the only thing of who you are. And I think if you can try to like just be honest about the times at which that identity is like really front and center and the times at which it takes a back seat, the audience will find you. Like, I don't know, there is an audience for, for that. Um, so I don't know, I think it depends on what is, what is like the subject that feels front and center for the story that you wanna tell. And then from there, I think you're figuring out your identity's place in that story, which is really difficult to unpick, um, yeah. I don't know. And again, I'm thinking about in the process of writing this book, like, like, I don't know how much did my identity shape my upbringing? And obviously it did, but it's a really difficult act to unpick some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really answer. I'm doing the I don't know thing. I know. I, was a, I gave a great answer. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, hi. hi. My name is Surya. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher. I do UX research, but anthropology by training. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about kind of interpretation. So I guess kind of to the point that you were just talking about, about how, you know, if you're as a person situated, how you, how others interpret you. Mm. But I think in when it comes to data visualization, especially your style of data visualization, where it is also very akin to art. And so in the art world, you have that kind of question of, for the audience, their interpretation of your piece and in, for you, your data visualization plays a certain kind of role in how it's kind of actioned and, and internalized. How do you navigate the way that your art is, or your visualizations, or both, you know, a mix, yeah. um, is, is kind of taken in and, and navigating that kind of space of, I'm presenting this kind of nebulous data that may has a certain context to it because of the way that you do present it. Um, and, you know, in the case of US and like the, even this piece right here and, and having the, the Statue of Liberty and very much situating it locally, but um, at the same time, not really having the breadth of context that is often missing from, you know, survey data and things like that, or yeah. even data visualization yeah, yeah. is really, um, you know, built off of how that person kind of internalizes your work. Such a good question. Thank you. Uh, I would say that, I mean, all artists, I guess, take a different stance on this of like whether, you know, I'm trying to tell you this one thing and that's what you need to take away from it. I think it, it really does depend on the subject that I'm depicting. So really weird example. Again, I looked at it this morning for some reason. I looked at like the percentage of adults that experience rectal bleeding. Um, and however you interpret the causes of that, I don't think it's necessary, because I'm not charting over time, it's just like one spot statistic. Um, I think that being open to interpretation is kind of okay if it means you go off and like do some querying of your own. If I'm depicting data on the efficacy of masks during the peak of the pandemic, actually my main concern is the possibility of misinterpretation and there becomes a really urgent need for you to walk away with not only a set of numbers, but a very clear understanding of cause and effect. Same thing with vaccination. Um, and so uh, I think for certain subjects, particularly when it comes to health, um, my concern is about eliminating certain types of misinterpretation that could do harm. And then whatever you're left with, feel free to interpret it kind of however, however you like, I guess. Does, it really depends on the subject, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Hi. I just want to, um, whenever I go to a doctor's office, I am asked to for some reason, they always want to know if I'm a male or a female. Mm -hmm. I always cross it out. I've been doing this for several years, and I write in, like, 
well, I write a screed. But you know, it was very interesting because I'm, I'm sure we all experienced that also. And I encourage you to do the same. But then I was uh, registering for this tonight. And I was, for some reason, I was asked about my gender. And there was a list of 12 different mm -hmm. genders that I should identify with. Um, some of which I thought were overlapping. And I wonder where we get to a point where we're not, we're just splitting too many penny. You know what I mean? I do, I do. Yeah. And also each of those categories for, for like data interpretation processes, purposes, sometimes the addition of extra categories means that you're left with sample sizes that are so small that there's actually nothing that you can do with them. However, I would also say that the act of filling out forms is also a political act, right? Not just the, the information design, but the act of filling it out. And I believe there are people that will come to those 12 genders and will see themselves for the very first time rendered on that page and will feel profoundly relieved and moved to see that. And I think that alone is a very good reason for keeping those 12 on there. Um, I think, again, it, it depends, right? Like, I would say that sometimes in the doctor's office, and this all comes down to, like, our relationship with the people who are gathering that data. Have you had positive experiences with medical professionals in the past, or have you had negative experiences? Do you believe that that ticking that box will help them to provide better care for you or worse care? And, like, will it mean that they dismiss your concerns? And so, again, like, it's about your relationship with the figures of authority. And sometimes, again, to pr produce those 12 genders actually can help people's relationship with both this institution and the people who run it. And it might alienate others. But I would say that maybe sometimes some of the people that get... Some of the people who feel frustrated by some of those things are people who... And I'm not suggesting this is the case for you at all, but sometimes some of that act of, some of why it bothers people is the discomfort of the change and the, the upsetting of what's familiar and what is known to us. And, and sometimes discomfort is a good thing. I also wonder why, why they, in order to buy the ticket to come here, I needed to identify my gender. Well, I'm sure there was a prefer not to say option, though. Yeah. Yeah, but why, was that, why are they even because I think I think institutions like this, in order to better serve communities, I mean, I really don't want to speak on your behalf, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and try. Um, <laughs> it's really important to know who your community is, right? And if, for example, one of the things that that yields is that there's a vast number of people who are in this event tonight who actually identify as non-binary, for example, but might not feel comfortable turning to their neighbor in the seat next to them and saying that, but they do feel comfortable saying it in a private form. That could affect something as simple as the, um, the bathroom designs in this building. And so that is really valuable information. It could affect the curation process of maybe we need to have more exhibits here that are done by artists who are non-binary to make sure that people are seeing work that's represented here. I think we do, I think we do sometimes because the, the reality is, and this goes back to, I agree, but like, should we do, like, so I agree. However, to go back to like Arabness, so I'm just gonna speak from my personal experience because I'm a, a cis woman, so I don't, I don't wanna speak to gender. As an Arab woman, we have no fucking clue how many Arabs there are in this country, right? So I can say, yes, of course this museum should have an exhibit that's done by an Arab person. But the museum's like, well, how many people are going to come to that? Is there really an audience for that? Is there really going to be demand for it? And a critical part of advocating, and this is where it gets really, really difficult, is that a critical part of advocating for yourself is the demonstration of need. However, I would also say that the over-reliance on data sometimes can be really problematic, where I would say, even if 0.5% of people in this room are non-binary, that shouldn't be a reason for not having an exhibition in here that's done by a non-binary person. However, the realities of fundraising and going to people sometimes requires saying, there is a community for this, please give us money for it. Like, do you want to say something? This is correct. <laughs> Just as a museum person, this is... This is correct, and okay. oftentimes yeah. we are forced, actually our director can speak a little, yeah. but, we're, but we're forced to provide cold hard numbers or yeah. cold hard facts to be able to get support to do things that are maybe outside of what we've done normally yeah. or new for us, or even to just continue what we've been doing already that has been successful. We have to show why we need to do what we need to do. But our- Yeah, our just to say, Mona's answer is spot on. Uh, you're hired, you can come <laughs> and work with us anytime. But just to say that, I also agree with you. Do we really need to 
do all of this to prove that this is what we need to be doing. And I think this is the unfortunate reality that um, that connects with the point that we were talking about be before, that we, w we live in an imperfect system. The system is profoundly fucked up, right? Um, but we need ways of convincing others sometimes to do that, uh, whether you agree or not that they need to be, you know, that we need to go through those systems. But I need to use it sometimes to convince others that do not a agree with uh, with maybe the the, the <laughs> fact that I, I don't think that I would need to be convincing them. So it's complex and it's imperfect, I would say. Um, I have a complicated relationship with data myself. I hate when I have to fill that kind of stuff. And then add to that the level of the federal government, which is like a whole other, other sort of like level of, so it's very complicated. So for me, as long as we're using it, and to subvert it a little bit uh, and to provide what I think we should be providing, it justifies its use um, as much as I sometimes wouldn't be my first choice. I guess that's my most honest answer that I can give. <laughs> oh, now there's some hands. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So I want to reach the back and then I'll come to you. Hello, my name is Bill, Hi, Bill. and uh, now I can see you, and oh, I want sorry, to... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If I could, just make a suggestion for the future. I think most of us came out to see you and the other guests, but it turned out to be like an audio cast. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, because nobody could see you. But anyway, um, I, I was sort of drifting in and out when you brought up Fort Greene. And I was a Fort Greene resident for about 20 years. And uh, I was a landlord, as a matter of fact. And so when you mentioned that, I started uh, just thinking back, uh-oh. But um, I realized. No, it's OK. I, he was definitely not my landlord, yeah. <laughs> no. no. But I realized chronologically it, it was impossible. Yeah. So that was OK. <laughs> but. Um, what I really wanted to uh, mention was you talked about the Middle East yeah. and uh, North Africa, and, and those are entirely bullshit, if Absolutely. I may say. Yeah. Okay. And they go back to um, the last century, maybe even a little before, it was British colonial construction to se make sure that it was separate from Africa. And if you look at the map, it's interesting because the Middle East is separated from Africa by the Red Sea, which is about 90 miles. And it's not even a complete separation because if you go f uh, further north, you can actually go around, you know, it's like a land bridge. Okay, so the Middle East is not part of Africa, definitely, according to the mainstream. But Madagascar, 500 miles away from the coast of Africa, is African. So think about that. I mean, it honestly brings us right back to the DNA data that we were discussing of what on earth does it mean to describe somebody as 23% black? Like we have lost sight of the fact that race is a construct mm -hmm. and we are treating it as if it is a scientific fact. Exactly. Which is scary, yeah. Thank you, Bill, and I'm, I'm sad you wasn't my landlord. I'm sure you would've been a great landlord. <laughs> I loved your I loved your idea. Of, I, I do data all day, and mostly what I do. Can I ask to, in what capacity? What do you? I'm a, a supervisory international trade analyst, um, oh, and wow. you may have seen some of my work in the last couple of years. I won an award for uh, part of it, um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Um, I created the three scenarios where we could actually try to do some of that law. Wow. That was my initial report. So. Though I used lots of other people's data, everything else, but the initial saying was whether we could do that law and get that law through. Mm -hmm. That was my three scenarios. Though they didn't go with my big one, which I had learned from the private sector, always throw out three scenarios. One really easy one, one that you can probably get, and one that's a dream. No trade with China was not going to fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was my third one. Um, but um, so, you know, I was pretty happy we got A and B. So, you know, but that was all done with missing data. And, you know, there were some very good people who won a Pulitzer also who really did some data and they communicated where I could find some data that yes. they had done. Yes. Other people did. Sheffield Halam University communicated with me. 
the anti-communist people. You, when you're doing data, you, you go with anybody. You don't care whether they're great or not. You just care that their data is clean. Oh, I don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> you care that their data is clean. Yeah. yeah. The cleaner the data, the better it is. You know. So. Even that even that adjective though for numbers feels deeply problematic. But keep going, keep going. So I what I love is that you had that one description where you were talking about the big circle for missing data. Yeah. Because most of it is missing data. So yeah. for something like the Uyghurs, it's going to be missing data mm -hmm. because these are missing people. They're just not shown and they're disappeared. And yeah. so you have to be able to show missing data and you have to find ways to visualize mm -hmm. those things. So I really love that. And I do that. I understand why people take large amounts of data because the data is how you get laws passed, yeah. how you get changes. Yeah. You need that data constantly. Otherwise, because there's a limited pie. Of, you know, the government has a limited pie. I mean, it'll be a bigger pie if they tax Bezos, but uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, there's a there's a pie, yeah. and you have to divide that pie, and you have to figure out what your priorities are in that pie, and just see where that pie is going to see what's actually happening with it. Um, so those are all important things that data can do, and like I always say with the um, Mena issue, just go with. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Why they, they have a really nice thing, the Arab League. They just pick out their countries that belong in the Arab League, and they've got their own little thing. They've already. But then, how would you, on a on a something like census data, the Arab League is a political body. The Arab League is a political body. Would you, just you wouldn't put that in there. I wouldn't check Arab League on well, my like census Arab, form you for my identity. Arabs, Arabs, ethnicities. But there are people who are ethnically Arab without necessarily speaking Arabic, right? Hmm. I mean, like you've got Sudan, where you know they're ethnically they're you know if you we, most people would consider them racially black, but they're Arab and they're in the Arab League. So when you've got Moroccans and Tunisians, and, I mean, it's really more of a cultural definition. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, who's uh, in the Arab League? Who's in the Arab League who doesn't speak Arabic? I I don't know if this particular night is the night. No, the true. Time and the but a fun, but a fun, but a fun one. Defining Arabness right this second. <laughs> but a fun well, one. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a tough call because how do you define a cultural group that is spread from... I, I think a, a big part of it is letting those communities define it. I think. Yeah. Like yeah. I said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank okay. you. Thank you. One more question over there. Um, okay. So if you... Okay, I guess you use a number of different data sources. Yeah. So sometimes you run into the issue that these different data sources do kind of lead to different conclusions. Yes. Also, a second question is that, like, if you're presenting data, how do you avoid the fact to not imply causality yeah. by a correlation. So yep. that's like a really important thing that people will, you know, basically see like an increase in X that is caused by Y. Yeah. So I guess, how would you approach that problem? Yeah. And, um, you know, are there any like data sets that you yeah. like working with or don't? And then how do you run into this issue that you look at something and then actually you would have a different conclusion if you looked at something from a different source. Yeah, so. yeah. So on conflicting sources, it's a really good question. Um, I think it's really important to look into uh, who is collecting the data, what their goals might be. Uh, dare I give an example that veers into Arabness potentially? I mean, it's actually, it's actually an example about Muslims. Um, so there was a statistic that was cited that was something like, I don't know, 60% of Muslims believe in jihad. And it was like, posted all over the Daily Mail in the UK. It was from this survey body. The survey, I like looked into the survey and the survey was many, many, many questions. The first question on the survey um, was, how do you define jihad? And the vast majority of respondents selected my personal peaceful struggle to be closer to God. So that automatically changes the definition of people supporting jihad. It was also an online form that anyone could opt in for. So no understanding of whether or not those people are Muslim or what. Fact number three, crucial fact, the survey was done by Kellyanne Conway's polling company. <laughs> Um, so there are steps that you can do to like figure out what are what are the resources. And honestly, I would say the tricky thing is that to give the example again of like sex workers or different marginalized communities, sometimes it's very specific bodies that are collecting that data where they are both far more accurate because they have built up the trust with that community to increase response rates. But it also means sometimes they're incentivized to sometimes inflate some of those numbers. Go on, go on. Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. 
you mentioned so many nuances they're super important yeah. uh, but how do you distill that complexity yeah, okay. to this kind of visualization okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. like okay, colors good. images and easy to digest so let me give a really concrete example that I've never done but like just just to to um, respond like tell me I don't know one thing that you're interested in um, anything could be like what you eat for breakfast I don't know um, I mean, like economic inequality, that's really okay, interesting. Okay, economic inequality. Or like social issues. Like. Okay. <laughs> so let's say there was a survey that was done to measure economic inequality, and it was asking people, have you had trouble paying for your groceries in the past month? And there's two different data sets, right? One of the data sets says 20% of Americans are struggling to pay for groceries, and one of them says 2%. One potential technique for visualizing that is to show 20% and 2% as two different bars, right? Like, let's use this. So there's a bar at the top that says 20% on the pink and a bar at the top that says 2% that's much smaller. And then down from those bars is a dashed line that now shows either with a circle or with a square the number of respondents that were included in that survey. And maybe the 2% survey had 200 respondents and the 20% survey had 10,000. And so now I'm presenting both sets of statistics to the audience and also giving them the opportunity to interpret for themselves which data set do you feel is more reliable. And imagine if on that same thing, I'm also showing the breakdown, we're out of time. We're also showing the breakdown of like, how much money was put into that survey? Am I also being able to show like with little state outlines, which were the communities that were interrogated? Was this truly across the country? Was it only certain places? So in an ideal world, I would present people with more than one data set. The thing that me and Du Bois, to like try and put a bow on it, um, were struggling with, <laughs> oh God, um, were struggling with all the time is this idea of fatigue on the part of the audience. I just assume that if I'm going to give you two or three data sets, you're going to be like, what, you want me to figure it out? That's on you. You need to tell me which is the data that I need to trust and just tell me what the information is saying. So the thing that I tried to do that I also think Du Bois tried to do is to step out the information. So maybe I just create one visualization that shows you poverty rates in the US. And if you want, you can use the next slide, you can scroll down, you can turn the page on the book and look at those information resources, the, those, in, those various information sources if you want. But my starting point is gonna be to assume you probably don't actually wanna know that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.